Uh, good evening, all. A warm welcome to the Gloria Gobi Kumar annual lecture, jointly organized by the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering and Alumni Association of GECT. To introduce myself, I'm Dr. Naushija, faculty in civil engineering and currently the secretary of the GECT Alumni Association. The annual lectures were conceived to commemorate the late Gloria Gobi Kumar, an alumna of 1984-88 Electronics and Communication Engineering batch of GEC, and this has been initiated by her classmates and friends. The first lecture in the annual series was delivered on 21, 2020 by Mr. T.N. Santosh Kumar at the Gloria Gobi Kumar Alumni Hall of GEC. It was on the same day that the Gloria Gobi Kumar Alumni Hall was inaugurated by GEC's own prodigy, Dr. Tessie Thomas. As known to all of us, the erstwhile Western Amphi of GEC was renovated using a contribution of Rs. 50 lakhs received from Sri Krishna Kumar, husband of Gloria, and the hall was renamed as Gloria Gobi Kumar Alumni Hall. That was to give an insight into the gesture of love and affection rendered by friends and family members of Gloria, who has been my batchmate as well and a dear friend close to heart. And this year, the lecture is being delivered by Mr. Ganesh Vyaya, who is also the batchmate of Gloria and belongs to the 1984-88 chemical engineering batch. The speaker will be introduced to the audience a little later, but before that, let's listen to a dear friend and classmate of Gloria, who will share his fond memories of her. We have with us today, Mr. Thomas Jules, an alumnus of the 84-88 ECE batch. He's currently the Director of Developments for Oracle America. Over to Thomas for sharing the memories. Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Naushita. And good evening to everyone and happy new year. I am Thomas Jules. Today, I'll take a few minutes of your time to share my memories of Gloria with you all. As Naushita, Dr. Naushita said, both Gloria and I are from Electronics and Communication Engineering 88 batch. Even though I know her since 11th grade, I met her on the first day of the classes in GECT. Since then, we became close friends. As you all might have heard, she's a vibrant girl and very good at making friends. She had a tremendous capacity, bandwidth, and willingness to make each friend a lifelong one. So whomever you ask, they will have sweet and personal stories to tell about their friendship. Soon after engineering, Gloria got married and accompanied her husband, Krishnan, to the USA. She pursued higher studies there and earned masters. Subsequently, she joined Intel Corporation and worked there till she retired. I took up a job in California a few years after working in India. So we became neighbors again. Even with the busy family and work responsibilities, she didn't change a bit. She always found time to keep in touch with all her college friends. Whenever any of our friends visited Silicon Valley, she hosted a party for all of us. She offered her house for them to stay in during their visit. Her dedication and compassion are unparalleled. It was unbelievable and shocking when I heard she left all of us. She created a vacuum with her untimely departure. From day one, Krishnan, her husband, realized and unconditionally supported her love for the college. The Gloria Memorial Hall is a proof of that. It was her dream and Krishnan made it a reality. As friends and alumnus and our passion for the college, we wanted to do what we can as well. We wanted to give you an opportunity to meet, listen and discuss with industry leaders like Mr. Ganesh Iyer who is also from the same batch. We hope to ignite the talents you have so that you can be tomorrow's technology leaders and executives in your area of interest. I know you're all eagerly waiting for Ganesh. He's an excellent speaker and has a lot of great things to share with you. So I won't bore you any further. I wish you all great success in your life. Ganesh, 
as a batchmate and a friend, we are proud of you. Thank you. So thanks, Thomas. Thank you. Trans transportation is one of the industries that hasn't evolved as much as many other industries. Today, Ganesh Bia will share with us on what's happening in the sustainable transportation landscape and what are some of the innovations happening lately. Ganesh is a distinguished alumnus of GCT and graduated in 1988 with honors in chemical engineering. Ganesh is the ma managing director and global CIO of NIO, a smart and connected premium electric car company in the US. He's a digital development and operations executive with over 30 plus years of experience delivering proven results in various industries, including autonomous tech, high tech, manufacturing and telecom. He is recognized for rebooting digital organization in emerging and global markets, and is an expert at change management and building relationships across the organization to achieve company goals. Previously, he was vice president at Telsa Motors for nearly five years, reporting directly to Elon Musk, where he led Tesla's e-commerce and global information technology organization. Prior to Tesla, he led senior leadership roles at VMware, Juniper Networks, WebEx, Electronic Data System, and Tata Consultancy Services. He lives in the Silicon Valley near San Francisco with his family. The theme of the lecture would be how to prepare for the fast-paced innovation landscape that's happening across all industries around the world. Over to Ganesh. Thank you, Naushija. Good morning to my friends here in Silicon Valley and also in in the eastern part of the United States and then Canada. So we have huge representatives from Canada as well. And good evening to all my friends, my respected uh, you know, fellow mates, the GCT alumni membership, the principal of the college, and uh, the alumni presidents, the leadership team, uh, Professor Krishna Kumar sir, and then Naushija. So uh, let me begin by just uh, you know, introducing myself first. Uh, before I do that, you know, I haven't personally had uh, very many close interactions with Gloria during my college years. That was 84 through 88. But I have very fond memories of having uh, very, very pleasant conversations with her during our frequent college days and other events. On this occasion where we are celebrating on her legacy, let me offer my sincere pranamans to her. She always had a very pleasant personality and always had a very beautiful smile in her face and was a very, very loving and caring person. That's my memory and interaction of uh, Gloria. So again, once again, Gloria, so I hope you are listening to this from heaven. So soon after I graduated in 84, 88 from uh, GECT, I joined TCS in Mumbai, Tata Consultancy Services. Initially, I really, really struggled, you know, being a chemical engineer by trade without having much programming expertise. I found it very difficult, to be completely honest, to navigate through the initial training program, which was very, very rigorous and uh, highly, uh, you know, the expectation was quite high for TCS back then. I believe it is the same even today. So the requirement was, you know, you have to get at least 80% in the probation period, 80% marks in the probation period. So a lot of my other batchmates, TCS batchmates during the training season, they're either from electronics, computer science, or in the relevant fields. Quite a few of us were in, in the non-electronics and, and computer science field. The reason I share this story is I always had a passion for you know, computer science, uh, right from you know, my pre-degree days back in 82, 83 days, 83 years. Um, Always I wanted to follow my passion, which was in computing and computer industry. So I didn't quit. Um, I put extra effort. And then, you know, I, fortunately I scored over 85% in my initial training. If I recall, I was looking at the, the certificate last night uh, before this preparing for the lecture. Anyway, I'm happy that, you know, I switched uh, my career and followed my passion towards computing and the computer industry as a whole. So, Soon after joining TCS Mumbai, then after a year, year and a half or so, the training session, then I took a transfer to TCS Bangalore. You may wonder why. You know, usually the trainees don't switch their job location that often. But 
I had a lot of GEC team, you know, my batchmates, they were all in, in uh, Bangalore back then, including Thomas Joseph. So I wanted to be part of that close-knit family and so that I don't feel a bit of that college life. Plus, it is Bangalore is much closer to my native place, uh, you know, Thuravur, which is pretty close to Alapi district. It's in Alapi district, uh, close to Ernakulam. So I took a transfer. My dad was alive back then, and then I, you know, I went to Bangalore, spent about a year or so in Bangalore. Then soon, you know, TCS being a consulting company, the only assets they have is the people. They ship, you know, ship me to overseas. I spent about two, three years in London uh, working for uh, TCS, and I was contracting for Oracle Corporation before landing in the United States in late '93. I was fortunate to, you know, since then I was fortunate to travel through various industry and gain um, experience. And I consider myself as a student even today. Um, so high, high tech um, industry, manufacturing, telecom. Um, I was fortunate to get some exposure and experience in those industries. And what I noticed during my 30 plus years of uh, professional tenure is that some of these industries have uh, innovated uh, much faster than some of the other, uh, their peer industries. For example, high-tech, manufacturing, telecom, they all made quantum leap innovations. And I will cover a bit more detail in the subsequent slides. But industries like healthcare, government, to a certain extent, even education, still there is a lot of weight for disruption. This COVID was a you know, big eye-opener for the healthcare industry, how bad it was, right? Nobody was prepared for this pandemic. It was a complete mess globally. Um, you know, I can speak for in the United States, it was a mess. You know, there was no infrastructure, no plan, nothing was put in place because the industry wasn't ready for such a pandemic, unexpected. Now there is some innovations happening, certainly in, uh, in the healthcare and education, right? All of a sudden, the, all the schooling, including kindergartners, it's all started going digital, right? There's no in-classroom in, in uh, instructor-led training. You know, going to kindergarten is like a party every single day, but poor kids, you know, nobody could even get out of their house. Then all of a sudden technology came in to rescue them, right? It's Zoom. And as we speak, now we are on Zoom, we are talking. Now the education industry now learned how to cope with this change. And then I bet, you know, tomorrow it's very well, it could be all, you know, digital training, online training. So... And I wanted to see, you know, what the ne next decade is going to bring for the education industry, you know, how the enrollment in the universities and, and other educational in institutions are going to take place. Because now the last 10 plus months now, the world has proven and our children are learning much more effectively than ever before. So disruption has now slowly happened in, in the education industry as well now. So before I go any deeper into this, Again, I want to just extend my sincere thanks to the principal, um, Dr. Shiba, and alumni leadership, uh, Professor Krishna Kumar, sir, and then Dr. Naushija, and the event organizers, especially to Dr. Nelson, the professor for electronics and communications department at GCT, and of course, my proud uh, worldwide alumni network, and last but not least, Certainly, the faculty members who have dialed in today, as well as for all the students, the aspiring leaders of tomorrow. So, when I was doing a dry run a couple of days ago with uh, Nelson, it was at you know 11 p.m. my time, which was you know morning time. I think it was uh, probably Thursday, if I believe. So Nelson said, uh, "You know, Mr. Ganesh, why don't you actually even you know show us your college life?" You know, take us through a quick five minutes, you know, how, uh, what are some of the, you know, great professors and, uh, you know, some of the renowned leaders that you met during our college days and who are some of your, you know, um, aspiring leaders and mentors that you follow. So I thought it's a great idea to actually break the ice conversation and then get connected with all of you much more closely. Here's my first most joyful life in my entire life which is my college life. This is a, a picture of my education and you know, of graduation back in 84, 88. And, uh, you know, I spent last night, I was looking and I was looking for this picture and I couldn't find it. Then I called uh, one of my close friends and batchmates, Nandu. Um, so he sent me from Dubai this picture. And uh, so 
I was super thrilled to see and then share with you. This is my uh, college days and then my graduation picture. You know, unfortunately, some of these great professors are no longer today with us. And I hope, you know, especially Dr. Nambudri sir, um, Narayanan sir, and et cetera, they're all listening to this. You know, I wouldn't be here without their leadership, their advice to bring me and all of the other alumni members where they are today. The next is, uh, again, as Krishna Kumar said before, said before, and Shashi alluded to, you know, we had a fun gathering when uh, Professor Krishna Kumar visited Bay Area back in 2014. So Shashi being our social cheerleader for the alumni here in the Bay Area, she proactively, you know, connected with a bunch of us, whoever could make it, I think we attended. So this was a picture that we took. Uh, this is our senior, Damu, and uh, quite a few senior folks and junior, and of course, Shashi, myself, and Thomas the three familiar faces here, um, but you get the picture. So we got together and then we had a lot of fun and reflection of our college life with uh, Professor Krishna Kumar. And the most joyful life part two is my family. Uh, they have been inspiring after the college days. I think this is my cheerleaders. It's my family, my wife, my two uh, children, they both uh, born here. Uh, this is Rahul, um, who is now started working in New York. He graduated from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And uh, this is Vivek. He just completed as of last night all of his college applications waiting for the results. So that's my family. They are uh, my joyful life period with part two. Speaking to Nelson again, he said, who are some of the you know, aspiring leaders and mentors uh, that you met during your professional career? So the first one that came to my mind was my ex-boss, none other than Elon Musk. I was fortunate to work for him. And in fact, he's the one who interviewed me uh, back in 2010 when I was working for VMware. So when the phone rang from Elon's office, my mentor, uh, you know, Mr. Bill Heil, who is uh, one of the senior execs from VMware, he discouraged me uh, to the nth level. He said, why are you leaving a software industry? Because in software industry, once you write the quality code, and you acquire the first customer, you start making money, you are printing money. But in auto industry, there is no such thing called printing money because it is the most capital intensive business humankind has created till date. Because building cars and making cars is not a joke, right? There is nothing called positive gross margin. It takes years and years and years. Even as you speak, you know, very few auto companies are making money. So they discourage me that why are you leaving this to go for this? you know, unknown company called Tesla. Mind you, back in 2010, and Tesla was unknown company. So then uh, when the phone rang, I looked at, you know, who is this guy, Elon Musk? So I Googled him and looked at his Wikipedia. I said, you know, yeah, he co-founded or he founded PayPal, the online payment, uh, payment engine. I re read about him. I thought a very inspirational leader. Then I said, actually, I should, uh, you know, take the interview with him. So I had a phone interview. It was on a Sunday afternoon. I was at my home in, in uh, Cupertino, and then Elon was at his home in Los Angeles. So 15 minutes phone call, and then um, this is true story, um, by the way. So he said, we are trying to create, Tesla is trying to create very innovative connected car, electric connected car, this planet Earth has never seen before. It's a new concept. It's a groundbreaking concept, and nobody believes that it is possible. I'm going to create it. So that was very intriguing vision statement that I heard from him over the phone. Then I thought maybe I should be part of this journey and then learn something new. I always consider myself as a student. Even today, when I'm speaking to all of you, I consider myself as a student because always I'm curious about learning new things, talking to friends, and then learning about what they are doing. So always trying to acquire and possess a new skill every single day. So I got amazed and I got really, really excited. Maybe I should give it a try. Then here comes the job offer. It was about 18% less salary than what I was making at VMware. And VMware is a very, very profitable company even today. And back then it was, you know, going in the, in the right direction. So there was no bonus, there was no nothing. Um, so it was an 18% less paid check that I bring to my family on a monthly basis. But the vision was very intriguing. Then I said, I think I should go and then join it. When I look back now, uh, you know, when I joined in 2011, to be exact, 
I made the absolute right career decision in my entire life, professional life. It's an honor to know him and work for him. And as we speak, he's the richest man in the entire planet Earth uh, by passing Jeff Bezos. So I'm so fortunate to know him and work for him. The next inspiring mentor and leader, I shouldn't say mentor, the leader I met is our Prime Minister Modi. When uh, Modi visited Tesla factory in 2017, his intent was to look for you know, some electrification project or projects rather um, to be situated somewhere in India. So he wanted to visit, he took time to visit many companies in the Bay Area, including Google, Apple, Oracle, et cetera, et cetera, all the uh, renowned companies. And of course he visited some manufacturing industries and one was Tesla because of the battery technology and the renewable energy business. I was one of the very few senior uh, Indian based engineers and the senior leaders there. So I was lucky enough to be the volunteer to give a factory tour to Mr. Modi. So we had good, uh, good chat, even though it was only five minutes, uh, but it was, I cherish those moments. It's an inspirational person, in my opinion. Very recently, I also was fortunate to uh, meet with the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister, Mr. E. Palani Swami, when he visited Bay Area. The intent was, you know, he wanted to bring in more renewable energy type initiatives back into India, mainly to his state. So he was interested in my company, NEO, uh, to go there and then see whether um, I'll be interested in setting up even a battery factory there. So these were some of the inspiration leaders. And Nelson asked me, you know, can you share some pictures? I thought it's, uh, it's not about me, but I just wanted to share some now getting to the, the meat of today, which is the topic, the industry shift and the fast-paced innovation. As I mentioned, you know, I traveled through in my career, um, you know, at least five, six industries I just touched on it. Um, high tech, manufacturing, telecom, networking, and then most recently automotive industry. So I've seen a lot of shifts in the industry and that is as a result of their innovation, how fast they are innovating. I start by having a very interesting quote from my ex-boss, none other than Elon Musk. In my exit interview, he said, if you don't reinvent yourself and change, you are gonna get disrupted before you know it. Don't stay doing the right thing too long because you will be disrupted and displaced by your neighbor who is inventing faster than you are. So this was a very intriguing quote and very appropriate for today's uh, you know, lecture session because it's all about innovation and then how shifts are happening in various industries. Let me take you through a few industries that I see and how these industries have evolved in the last uh, you know, 20, 30, or even 40 years old. The first one is you know, very familiar to this group and to our alumni audience here, which is all the compute industry. Um, if you look back since 1940, all the way through 75, roughly, the whole computer industry was dominated by mainframes. Of course, IBM being the number one company and then digital right after that. They started innovating and started putting the mainframe systems. Started with obviously, the, the underpinning is always the, the vacuum tubes. Then, and I know many of us remember the, the early days of floppy disks started coming in, but they took too long to stay in that mainframe. But in parallel, back in you know 70s onwards, Intel, Microsoft, and Cisco started innovating faster than they started seeing IBM is taking way too much time to move that innovation needle to the, to the right, what's next, right? So they came up with this client server infrastructure for the compute industry. Guess what? Now all of a sudden the customers started following the client server architecture. And then you know, from a command line interface, it started moving into more uh, GUI based, the graphical user interface interfaces, microprocessors, you know, Intel started um, innovating much faster. You know, Gloria was one of the very senior engineers back in the days. In fact, I think she was the first Intel engineer, um, I think in my memory, our college had ever produced. I think even when I was in the third year of college, I think Gloria was offered a job at Intel as, a, as an entry level engineer. She, she continued her journey with Intel for, you know, I think nearly 20 plus years um, before this tragedy happened. So uh, I think she, I'm sure that she will be, uh, she would have been very, very instrumental in a lot of the innovation that took place and from Intel as part of moving the needle towards client server infrastructure. Again, they took a little bit too long. Then this little company called Google back then, given but, right? Google started as a simple search engine, but soon they realized that 
you know now um, everything has a service uh, idea or the disruption or the business model started coming up and people started talking about it. the senior business leaders started talking about it so they didn't waste any time and then amazon also was given birth during that time frame 95 through early 2000 they are the pioneer they came up with this concept of cloud computing all of a sudden the customers started migrating they migrated from the mainframe to client server now they soon started shifting into the cloud uh, computing today now again now it is shifted towards shifting towards more of a cognitive so now you know it's because data is exploding right now it is every single person has you know mobile phone now including our grandmas our parents and you name it everyone has it i was just looking at some data last night it says today um, you know apple store has 1.96 million apps available for download 1.96 million and on google play android base it's 2.87 million apps are ready for you know download so all of that apps create a lot and lots of data, which means there has to be some much faster, higher compute infrastructure and technology in that. NVIDIA of the world started creating the GPU clusters and now it is NPU, the neural network based processing because machine learning, deep learning type technology started coming up because data is exploding every microsecond or millisecond, I should say, because of all of these explosion of apps. In fact, uh, in the, on the app front, um, again, the research shows 21% of the millennials, the youngsters, they open an app at least 50 plus times every single day. Just imagine that, just process that. 50 times a day, an average millennial opens an app at least 50 times a day. Every time you open the, uh, you know, an app, there comes the data. So there is enormous data explosion that's happening. So it's shifting more towards cognitive computing. But you get the idea. So the computer industry went through significant transformation from 1940 all the way through 2020, and it's continuing. Same thing happened in the mobile, in the mobile phone industry. Uh, when the first you know, mobile phone came in, it was obviously Motorola and the Nokia were the pioneers or the incumbents. So they started, it's, it's all about you know, cellular switching infrastructure. Then it started with the you know, 1G uh, cellular uh, technology and infrastructure. Then it started evolving it until again, the cloud computing started and Apple started creating their first smartphone product called iPhone back in 2007, right? 2007, January or something around that time. You know, as we all know, Apple is the, the, the most uh, valued company on planet Earth, as we speak, which is about north of 2.1 or 2 trillion US dollars is Apple market cap. If you look back, when Apple launched this, uh, you know, the first apps uh, through the uh, iPhone one back in 2007, uh, you know, Apple's market cap was about hundred billion, just hundred billion US dollars. It's significant, but in relative terms today, when you look back, hundred billion was relatively small, right? That's because, you know, again, since 2007, when they launched this, uh, um, the apps model, today now it is 2.1 trillion. That is almost what, 21 times Apple market cap grew from the day that they launched the first smartphone to where they are today. Why? Because as I mentioned about nearly 2 million applications or apps are now ready for download every single day and more are being created. Hundreds are coming up almost every single week, if not every single day. So that's exploring. That also putting a lot of pressure on the cloud computing. So Amazon and Alexa even now, uh, Amazon and uh, Microsoft now, they are uh, shifting towards a more and more cl a cloud push. Certainly Google and uh, Oracle, uh, which Thomas is part of. Now there is a lot of push towards the cloud from the Oracle cloud and Google cloud. So everybody's shifting towards the cloud infrastructure, but you get the point. So this, the mobile industry forced, um, you know, uh, the innovation to the, to the right. Now it is all context where, right? It's, it's moving towards that because everything is now uh, computer vision enabled. So there is more context where innovation happening in the mobile. Same thing happened on the software industry, right? Software industry also started, um, you know, it's mainly the innovation happened driven by the, you know, the modularity. It started with integrated hardware and software until Unix operating system came in, then it became open source, Linux came in, then the APIs driven, web APIs driven uh, technology and innovation evolved. Now it is all about everything as a service, right? Education as a service, healthcare as a service, you name it as a service, eventually, you know, 
world could be as a service. Everyone could be tapped into any service from anywhere on the planet Earth as a service. So the whole digital economy is now has moved into as a service model, which led all the you know the main ones are software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and of course platform as a service. So that's putting that software innovation um, at a much much faster at a quantum leap now. Now let me spend a little bit about my most recent experience about the automotive industry. So all the other prior in three industries that I just walked you through have significant, significant innovation at a quantum leap, but automotive was still not being disrupted at all, if you ask me honestly, until Tesla came in. What I meant by that is if you look at this chart, you know, since 1900 all the way through 70s, it was all mechanical and hydraulic driven internal combustion engine innovation for moving objects and humans like us from point A to point B, right? It was all Ford, General Motors, and to a certain extent, even Toyota. It was also during this, uh, this time frame, the internal combustion engine came out. So, but it was all hydraulic driven innovation and mechanical driven innovation uh, that drove it. They, they stayed too long there. Then soon uh, disruption took place and it slowly shifting, shifted towards more electro and mechanical which I loosely call it as mechatronics. It's mechanical still, but there is a lot more electrical and electronics technology bent inside this automotive um, called cars. So as you can see, it's, you know, uh, initially it was AMFM radio, then it shifted to streaming. Now it is all streaming until um, Tesla came up back in 2000 or, you know, mid 2000, I should say. They shifted that needle towards more of a connected smart car, um, you know, innovation technology model. So now all of a sudden it started, um, you know, Tesla pioneered and then they started creating this, uh, you know, digital, uh, you know, automotive industry innovation. And I, you know, I was part of that journey uh, back in 2010 onwards when uh, in fact I joined when the first Model S, in fact, Model S was not even in production. It was still an R&D phase uh, as an alpha or beta version. But the innovation and the, and the, and the vision was very intriguing. That's the only reason I joined there. I'm so happy that I took that decision. So what's next? I think all the engineers and the smart people beginning to understand the limits of automation now. There's only so much because, you know, software was eating the world. Not anymore. I think the artificial intelligence powered by the deep learning, machine learning started eating the software. Right? Think about it. Again, the next set of innovation is all about artificial intelligence, robotics, AI, powered by machine learning, deep learning technologies. That's where the industry is moving. So the humans and engineers started beginning to understand the limits of automation. Everything shifted. Now, this term IoT, the Internet of Things, has shifted towards more intelligence of things because every gadget is now more intelligent, powered by artificial intelligence. Now that IoT has shifted to more AOT, autonomy of things, because everything is now, um, you know, it's driverless, humanless. Everything is, you know, it, it's becoming more of an autonomy. So, what's underpinning when I look at this is, conversational AI has, uh, you know, gone into pretty much everything now, right? Even the TV set, for example, that we all buy around the world, you know, hardly anyone is using the remote control. Right, everything now you can talk to it because all these you know uh, gadgets are coming with, you know the Google Play, Apple Play, and Alexa embedded and built within it within the hardware. So you can talk to the TV and then say play this channel, play that channel, stop this video, skip the ads, whatever you want. Conversationally you can react to it. So the point is everything is now voice driven. That is where the innovation is moving. Digital assistants are going into everything, as I mentioned, whether it's a device, appliance you know, appliance could be TV, refrigerator, you name it. Everything is becoming voice enabled and even into cars. And I'll give you a couple of examples about, you know, how the AI is covering the car industry, the smart car industry. Um, the support for this digital assistance has become a table stakes, especially for CIOs and the technologists uh, around the world. You know, sub this support of the uh, AI, uh, digital assistance, conversational AI engine is becoming a table stakes. It's just like, you know, supporting a health desk function. If you don't have this in your strategy, then you are, you, you are an outdated CIO or a technologist, right? It's going into everything. Now the support becomes a digital. 
that's primarily because the voice is becoming the de facto go-to interface now, right? As I mentioned, you talk to the TV now. You don't press and look for your remote control anymore. Your everything is there in your fingertips. It's your voice, right? So, why it is important? Because you know now the 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 connectivity industry, you know, it was also keeping up with what the rest of the industries are demanding and where they are headed. Since 80, every decade, um, the uh, the connectivity or the communication industry has been disrupting, starting with 1G back in 80s, and it's been shifted towards, now it is as we speak, we are all in 5G. If you don't have a 5G in your phone, I think you are, you know, you are an old guy, right? You are not a, you know, the current, uh, you know, kind of millennial type person. So everybody wants the latest and greatest in technology, right? Right from a child who is going to kindergarten, he or she has a smartphone that is equipped with a 5G connectivity. The reason being is, you know, in the last 30 years, we have been connecting people, right, to the phones, right? When I was, when I wanted to, you know, talk to Shashi or my parents back in India, it was, uh, you know, I used to call from my landline. And then when the uh, you know, when the cell phone came in initially, I remember it was, I used to pay about, you know, dollar eighty, one dollar eighty cents per minute to make a call to India to speak to my mother. So we used to write inland or so the letters because the email wasn't that prevalent there. And of course, my parents didn't have the computers at home to send the emails too. So because we spend a lot of time in connecting people, but now everyone has gadgets in their hand, right from a child who is born from the mother's womb. The, the child is uh, you know, holding a smartphone in his or her hand. So the next 30 years or so, I think we will all spend in connecting things. So that industry is, that's where it is moving. So on the vehicle technology, as I mentioned, the auto industry is still a lot of catch up to do to, uh, you know, on the innovation, but we are on the right track. So how does internal combustion engines, in my view, um, this is Ganesh Ayer's view, um, you know, why the traditional OEMs? OEM is the original equipment manufacturers, which is mainly General Motors, Ford, Toyotas of the world, the internal combustion engine uh, leaders back then. Their innovation was, which I call it as car 1.0, which is truly mechanical and hydraulic system. So their innovation started with this, um, you know, internal combustion engine um, powertrain systems. You know, how can we create an internal combustion engine which can move objects and humans from point A to point B. Then gradually they started, uh, because the 2.0 disruption started occurring, then this traditional OEM, they, they started thinking, I think we better start investing and start innovating in the e-powertrain, you know, moving away from the internal combustion engine to electronic powertrain, which is motor, inverter, and the electric battery itself, the lithium ion battery itself, because otherwise these companies will go out of business before you know it just like Motorola and the Nokia, then completely out of business. Because no one has that phone. I kept one for so many years, so at least, you know, I can look back and say, hey, I, I had a Nokia and a uh, Motorola phone with me. But the, it, according to me, I think all of these internal combustion engine cars will get displaced in the next probably 20 years from now. It's all moving towards more electric and smart connected era. But you get the point. So the focus was on the exterior design. So we need to have design, um, you know, mechanical engineers were mainly looking at designing coolest exterior looking, sexy looking cars. So that's, that was the norm or the term that we used to use it, right? The car has to be really cool and looks very sexy. It was pretty capital intensive because all these OEMs started investing their own factories and they did not outsource and everyone wanted to do it because nothing existed before. Then came in the car 2.0 era, uh, 2.0 era when you know, it's people started shifting from mechanical to more electric and electronic driven. This is when the Tesla started. Their core innovation was not internal combustion engine, e-powertrain. Uh, if you look back at Tesla's history, uh, they didn't create the first, you know, the, the first car, the proof of concept, which is called uh, a Roadster, which was extremely, um, extremely powerful sports car. I think Tesla made about 2,500 units or so. The uh, you know the the proof point that Elon was uh, are trying to prove to the world is that you know can an e-powered train um, uh, innovation is sustainable for the future of transportation. So that that is when his core was mainly on this powertrain innovation. 
Then once the prototype it, he said, now I need to build a car and I don't have a factory. I don't know how to build it. Then he shifted this to uh, a company called Lotus in UK. So Lotus is the one who made this Tesla's Roadster car. When the cars came back and Elon started driving this and I said, man, this is really cool. And you know, it gives the same range uh, as an internal combustion engine car and it is powerful. It is actually, you know, uh, zero carbon footprint because there is no emission, uh, there is no pipes in the car because it's, there is no uh, carbon emission coming out of it. I think this concept could be the next big thing that auto industry can has ever seen. So he started innovating more. Uh, then again, uh, then he started building his own car, which is a Model S, uh, uh, was a premium luxury smart connected EV car. Until about 2014 or 15, Elon started looking at autonomy, driverless car concept, right? So autonomy became a feature uh, in the car. So you can only, as long as it's, uh, it's, it was not a you know, core innovation from the ground up, you know, your, your product that you have innovated so far, the new feature could be very, very suboptimal, right? It, it'll be very suboptimal. So, but still Tesla folks, uh, you know, focused on uh, making great cars, meaning the exterior design was also a priority for them they decided to do the manufacturing themselves because nobody knew how to make an electric car. So uh, Elon set up his own factory and he learned a lot from it. And uh, it was pretty capital intensive because they did everything themselves because nobody knew how to do it. Until now the next generation concept came in uh, because there's a lot of learning from Tesla. Now a lot of other companies started thinking, you know, autonomous driving or autonomy is a feature. Now Tesla has started proving it. Why can't we take the autonomy as a core innovation in the car and then build around the car around it? If so, how should we build an architecture car, right? So when the car becomes truly autonomous, which means me and you are not driving, which means we should have more immersive experiences given to us within the car. We should be able to do the commerce. Uh, today we do the commerce, meaning we are buying our products either from the web or from the smartphone, mobile phone right now. If you're not driving into the car, there's no reason why we cannot envision to enable commerce as an immersive experience in the car. Same thing on the content. So any other content that we, today we go to web or, or to the apps, the content can be delivered within the car itself when we are not driving and then the entire you know, cockpit of the car becomes a complete digital screen, right? It is gonna happen in my opinion. And it can be more productive because you're not driving, which means, uh, you know, when you spend time from, uh, you know, from your home to your office or for, from your home to our college uh, for our faculty members, wouldn't it be nice if we can, you know, get that 30 minutes or 45 minutes or even up to one hour of driving to yourself so that you can prepare for the lecture that you're gonna to give to your students. because you are much more productive now, right? This is not a utopia concept. I think this is where the industry is moving. The autonomy, autonomous cars uh, industry is disrupting every single day. There are a lot more companies that are innovating there. Some companies are building the entire car. Some of them are just developing the technologies. So there are over 100 or so companies are innovating and they are betting in you know, 2025 to 2030 timeframe, level four autonomy, autonomous cars is gonna be a reality, right? So when we design um, the autonomous car, the design for the car interior has to be looked at using a different lens. As I mentioned, like when you are not driving, for example, why can't we reimagine the interior of the car? Um, let me give you a quick exa example. For example, you know, Shashi and I, or Thomas and I, we are pretty close friends. So if I invite Shashi to my house, I don't configure my house, you know, just to make it too formal because, you know, we are pretty close friends and all that. So I, I don't configure my house, interior of the house, um, any different than in my normal days. But that paradigm, the use case changes the moment, for example, I invite Professor Krishna Kumar or uh, you know, the principal Shiva to my house because it's become much more formal. Then I may rearrange my sofa set, I may rearrange my formal living room where I entertain and I welcome uh, these uh, distinguished guests. So I configure my house according to that event. Why can't we reimagine the car when you are not driving why can't we have that? So time has become the new premium. You know, in the, in the, in the olden days, when, when you define what is luxury means within a car, it used to be the leather seats, premium seats, Napa leather seats, and chrome-plated wheels or knobs, 
those were the norm for the luxury. Not anymore. It's a time is a new premium because the complex we uh, the world we all live in. I think we all demand. Gee, if I had that extra 30 minutes, I could have been much more productive, or I can get an extra 30 minutes sleep. So you want to be. So time has become it, and space has become the new luxury, right? Because as I mentioned in this example of about your own house configuration, so you should be imagining how to configure the interior of the car depending on the time, the moment in time, and then the context. And it needs to be flexible, meaning the car should or interior of this autonomous car should be able to give that immersive experience experiences, whether it's a productive experience, a peaceful experience, or a playful experience, okay? So it's very easy said and done, right? So to me, the vehicle is becoming a supercomputer tomorrow. So as engineers and the innovators, the students who are becoming the next generation super technologists and the leaders, aspiring leaders, should all be thinking about if this car industry becomes truly a um, how should they look like? It is nothing but a computer on wheels, right? So there's no different than, you know, you know, Amazon on cloud for processing an enormous amount of data. So why can't the car be architected and imagine, reimagine like a supercomputer? It all starts with, you know, full resilient autonomy. The car has to be built up from ground, ground up for the failed operational powertrain, e-powertrain, and the chassis, which is mainly the ingress, egress, the doors and all that. Today it's all fixed, right? There is four doors in the car. Tomorrow, who knows? Uh, you know, when you reimagine the car, the the whole infrastructure for the ingress egress might change. The entire vehicle network um, has to be reimagined. What I mean by vehicle network is all the, you know, as you may know, a lot of these cars, smart cars, are ECUs, the electronic control units, which is mainly processing the instructions that you are giving, whether it's you know roll down your windshield wipe, you know the uh, the windows or you know, put the wiper when it rains or, you know, open up your, um, uh, the roof, sunroof, et cetera, et cetera. All those commands are, um, you know, the car behaving because of the, the ECU instruction that is given. So all that needs to be reimagined and car has to be architected like a modular approach, right? And then at the top of the stack is mainly the digital living space. As I mentioned, it is all about immersive experiences. Everything is immersive ex experiences. So you have to reimagine that. It's UI UX. Keep it simple. Why Apple phone is so successful? Because from day one, they, uh, they give enormous importance to the user interface and the user experience. Even a grandma or a kindergartner knows how to operate an iPhone today. It's not a joke, right? Because they made it so easy, slick to use it. So you have to look at the reimagining when you design the new car of tomorrow. Um, I think the UI UX is. All that is you know, backend supported, which means everything becomes smart, everything becomes connected. That means security becomes a much, much more important ingredient that we should look at. From design of the car to the incept, to the destruction of the car. The moment the car comes out of the production line, there is a digital certificate being installed because that's identification of the, uh, you know, the birth naming ceremony of the car. There is a digital key being installed and all the smart cars are connected. Of course, the hackers, their job is to find ways to write malware and then put it inside you know, computers are even into cars. So the security has to be reimagined or rethought through from design of the car to the destruction of the car, the entire lifestyle ecosystem. So at, at my company, we looked at, you know, the industry, security industry is also evolving, right? There is no one comprehensive solution that can take care of, you know, from the birth to the death for a car. So we looked at, there are some solutions that uh, mainly provide security solutions that they take care of, uh, you know, the, intrusion detection. Some are working on intrusion prevention. So there is no comprehensive intrusion detection and prevention, meaning, you know, a hacker, a student in, you know, a, a student in a university dorm, they are writing malware. Their job is to find, you know, how can I hack? I mean, they are smarter. They are smarter than we think they are. They are writing, you know, from Eastern Europe and other parts. That's where we see a lot of malwares are coming in. So, um, so we, at, at my company, we said, you know, there are no um, comprehensive end-to-end -end solution. Let's start reimagining the security, how it should be. So I'm, I'm very proud to say that, you know, we've designed our own security solution. And of course, uh, the, during the development phase of this uh, autonomous cars, um, you know, the car has to make the same complex decisions 
on the road that me and you as human drivers, uh, we do today. Like today, our sensors are our eyes, our ears, our hands, all of our sensors, right? We make a complex decision when we are driving on the road, you know, whether it's in California or in Trichur. So when there is a pedestrian crossing the road abruptly, our sensors, our eyes and ears and the, and the hands immediately take the complex decision. We apply the brake, nine out of 10 times we are successful, and then we let that pedestrian who should not have crossed, um, you know, successfully maneuver and then cross the intersection. Guess what, tomorrow we are not driving. So the car has to make the same complex decision as if a human like me and you had made till yesterday. It's not that easy problem to solve, which means when the car goes in during the development phase, you know, there are various gadgets on the sensors, like the eyes and ears, the cars have the LIDARs, the sensors, uh, the trifocal cameras, you name it, all the sensors are there during the development phase. Their job is to collect and suck up all the data that it sees on the road. And when the car comes back to the, to, uh, to the garage, the engineers wanted to see what the car has said. The problem is, you know, various sensors, they are sensing and collecting its own data sets in a different time slice intervals. But the engineer wanted to stitch all the data and then see the continuous stream of data. It is very hard problem to solve because we are talking not small amounts of data. Just to give you a frame of reference for a level four autonomy type car, uh, you know, at least in my company, my head of uh, uh, autonomy, he said every single car, um, you know, every single hour, it can spit anywhere from 10 to 12 terabytes of data per hour per car during development phase. Just process that for a second. 10 to 12 terabytes of data because it has all these sensor gadgets, right? Everything is collecting at extremely high, um, you know, bandwidth and the clarity, which means it puts enormous amount of data storage and the cloud infrastructure needs. Um, now there's, you know, Amazon and Alex, you know, Microsoft and Oracle Cloud and Google Cloud, they're all innovating to act. It's not e-commerce transactions where they used to process billions of e-commerce transactions per minute, but now the throughput is much higher because of this autonomous car industry is putting it. So there's a lot of innovation. So these are the foundation. So this is how I, I think of when the car, tomorrow's car, um, autonomous car needs to be architected. It needs to be thought through as a supercomputer on field. Ganesh, so, can, can we ask questions here? I mean, this, sure. is, this is Santosh here. I mean, one of the pleasures of owning a car is obviously driving it, right? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. don't you lose that when you go into an autonomous world? The whole idea is the experience, right? And are we losing yeah. that from a, from a human perspective? I'm looking at it not from a technology perspective, but from a human perspective. Are you That's not losing question. that when you go into an autonomous world? And when so, we get into that, I would say, why would I even want to own a car? I don't have the experience. Just sitting in a car to go from point A to point B doesn't make sense to me. But the whole idea of driving that machine gives me an experience, right? Sure. So what, sure, great... what are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, it, it is going to take time to get to that stage, right? I think we all know it is, it, it is a complex problem to solve. Uh, let me see whether I can answer this through this, this particular slide we are looking at. So there are five levels. The, these are the, the experts defined. There are five degrees in autonomy, level one through level five. So level one, um, in simple term, is feet off of the car, off the pedal, which means cruise control. Every single car on planet Earth has cruise control. You set the speed, you take your feet off the pedal, the car drives by itself at that speed. That is the first level of autonomy. Every single car has it. But you as a human is still in control to take the action because its car cannot do it. It is just for you know, certain use cases driving. You know, when you are in a highway where there is less congested uh, traffic, then it's okay for you to set the cruise control at 40, 50, or whatever kilometers per hour you want to set it as it drives. But you are in control of the safety of yourself, the car, as well as the surroundings. Level two becomes your feet off plus hand off. Occasionally, you can take your hand off the steering wheel as well when you're driving it, right? So that's what Tesla started with. Um, you know, when you are again in certain use cases, you know, you can at least you and take your hand off and take some stuff from your you know, suitcases or whatever you have in the passenger seat or in the back, it's okay for you to take at least, you know, 
30 seconds, you are handoff. So that is level two autonomy, but still the human driver is in control. Now it's, this is where it has started getting more interesting. Now the automated driving system started shifting the control from the human driver to more automated control. So now this is where we are in. Then level two, between level two and three, I should call it about 2.5 to three is where, as you speak, the industry is. So which is your feet off, hand off, plus your eye off the road. That's a level three autonomy. So even though in the level two, you are take you are taking your hand off the steering while taking your phone or purse or whatever you want to take it from here, but your eye is still intermittently on the road. But at level three, you can take casually or even more time of this. Tesla has that. I think now it is, I own a Tesla, I drive a Tesla. When I drive long distance, I always put this in uh, autonomous driving board in highways, of course. And then it drives by itself. Now it can uh, automatically change the lane uh, when it is safe to do so. All of that is possible. It is proven now as we speak. Where industry is moving or, you know, Elon is challenging that, you know, Tesla is already here is level four, which is high degree of automation, which is your feet off in level one, your hand off in level two, your eye off in level three, and now your mind off in level four. Just imagine that for a second. Assuming we are having this conversation, we all having this conversation inside a level four autonomous car. Our feet is not on the ground, you know, there's nobody's driving because it's autonomous. Feet is off the pedal, eyes off the steering wheel, your eyes off the road, and your mind is also off. We are having productive conversation here. So that is where the level four comes in. To your point, Santosh, is you still want to enjoy driving because that is your passion. You want to, you know, that's why this little thing called car was ever invented. You certainly can do that every, because still, um, in my opinion, I think getting to that level five, level five, you know, I, I jokingly say it's like there could be a situation where would you like driving, uh, you know, the steering column or steering wheel as an option? There could be a situation tomorrow, car dealers, uh, they might offer, hey, would you like Mr. Santosh uh, steering wheel as an option because it's truly level four? Yeah, I mean, humans, yeah, I can. I mean, it, it's a hypothetical use case, but the point is, I think there is, until level four is safely proven, uh, still, I believe there will be a steering uh, in the car and you should be able to drive if you enjoy driving and you want to be the human driver control. Absolutely. But, you know, I imagine when our, um, you know, our grandchildren, for those of us who have children now, or students who are watching, when you have your children in the future, I bet there may or may not be a driver's license need at this part because you know you're not driving because every, the whole industry could be shifted towards fully autonomous and electric, smart, connected, and autonomous. So I think it is uh, industry is going there, but uh, it, I, in my humble opinion, I don't think the technology will be the the barrier. Uh, you know, there is much more than that. It's it's all the policy makers, the environment. Uh, for example, you know, when we in India, unless you honk the uh, you know, the, your horn, you're not a driver because that is the way that we communicate. But the same thing, if you do that in the US, that means you honk the car only if you are really cursing the driver in front of you. You know, he or she in front of you have done something really, really stupid. And that's why you are honking the car. But in India, that's the way of communicating, right? It's a, it's a culture difference, right? So tomorrow, uh, you're not driving it. I think it's even the, driver's license concept, I think that's yet to be seen. Will there be a need for a driver's license? Okay, um, yeah, I mean, that's good, Ganesh. So my, my point again was, I think it's about the human element to all of this, right? The experience. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why people owned cars, right? The yeah. driving experience. Now you're taking that away from them. And then the question is, you're, you're getting from point A to point B, and why do you need to even own a car if you're not driving you it? Yeah. There could be yeah. different modes of transportation for people to get from point A to point B. And then yeah. the question comes, why do you, now, especially in, in this scenario that we are in today, why do you need to even get from point A to point B? Because you've got work from home kind of concepts, yeah the office concept is going away, why do not even commute from a location to another location, right? And then the yep. whole concept of transportation changes, right? 
then yep. you might end up with a situation where you don't even need to own a car anymore, right? So yep. the whole dynamics is going to change over a period of time when you start thinking of all these concepts that's coming in, right? So to me, the concept of owning a car was the experience that when you drive it and what you gain out of it. But that's going away when you talk about driverless cars, right? Autonomous. I mean, and it's about yeah. maximizing your time to do something else that's more valuable, what you think is more valuable or what we all think is more valuable than spending time on the road for two hours from getting from point A to point B. But you're losing out the whole experience of running a machine, right? Yeah, I mean, it's you're absolutely sir, Santosh. I mean, because everything is, as I said, you know, it's moving towards as a service model, transportation as a service. Now, let me ask you this, right? When Uber and Lyft, and uh, you know, in in India, um, the ride-hailing companies, uh, you know, it's not coming to my uh, brain immediately. There are a number of uh, uh, ride-hailing companies in India too, right? It's transportation yep, I think as a it's service. Lyft, yeah. Uh, Lyft, yeah. So. Airbnb, they try to disrupt, you know, rental home, uh, your homes, because you are hardly you when you are traveling, um, you know, both your yourself and the spouse are traveling, you know, your asset, most important, most valuable asset, an expensive asset you ever purchased is your home, but the house is not being hardly used, right? It's been underutilized asset. That's where the Airbnb saw that disruption. But even though Airbnb came in, but still the ownership model hasn't changed, right? I still want to own my own house, even though it's been 20% utilized. Same with the cars. Just because ride hailing has come in, it's easy way of mode of transportation, especially in congested areas. Just imagine, you know, um, I'm sure when Trichur and any, any other cities in any state or any country, it is so damn congested than ever before. Finding a parking is just impossible. That is when the transportation as a service model comes in. You just take as a service, and then you pay for your ride and then be done with it. Then you are on your own. But still, I don't think the ownership model is going to change just because, you know, the transportation or the autonomous car. That's what I see. I think people who are truly enjoy driving, like yourself, you said, if you'd like to be the human driver, I think that option will still be there. Um, just like the analogy of Airbnb and others, that industry hasn't changed or shifted the owning the homes or owning the cars. Okay, I think, so, yeah, that makes sense, right? For those who, yeah. who really enjoy driving something, right? And then, in fact, I would even say that the people who still enjoy the shift gear kind of cars, right? Even though most of it has gone into automated gears, but a lot of people who still enjoy shift gears, right? That'll still remain. Yeah. That's a whole pleasure of, you know, having a machine and driving that from point A to point B. It's not about getting to point from point A to point B, but it's about that experience, right? It's a journey that makes it a lot more pleasurable. That's right, that's right. Uh, by the way, even, even the uh, one, one other point I want to mention, I think you brought up the ownership versus um, the autonomous. Well, even Tesla, when they started looking at this autonomy as a feature, they didn't create it. The product team did not create this. They did a lot of user insight study. Elon sent people to various parts of the uh, United States, interviewed, the doctors, the engineers, the soccer moms, the baseball dads, identifying and asking them questions. What do you like and you don't like in today's cars? What does premium mean to you? What do you wish my car had this or that? So there were a lot of those insights we are gathered and studied from all of these different user profiles before coming up with this. I think this is how the car of tomorrow should be reimagined because this is what we heard from the users. At the end of the day, the product is served only as good as the users want it, right? So bring in the user in perspective, that is when these insights have been derived. Like, you know, I think the luxury is, um, you know, time is a new luxury. That's what we heard from the user insights. And, you know, uh, you know I'm, ex you know, extrapolate, you know, um, you know, that concept to the rest of the world, but may or may not be uh, true. So I'm just yeah, looking at the I clock know. and I have- Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, time is right? the most valuable the commodity. Time is the days. most valuable. Yeah. Very true. So, um, you know, I have a few more slides, and in the interest of time, I think I'll flip through pretty quick. And uh, 
So this is the reimagination of the interior of the car. This is a production car, by the way. It's my company, Neos, the first car that we launched in, in uh, 2007, and it's called Neo ES8, uh, which is this to show that sophisticated mobile, mobile living space concept. The main thing I want uh, your attention is this little thing that, that is protruding on your dashboard. Uh, we call, it is the first, the world's first in-car artificial intelligence unit. We call it as Nomi. We named that product as Nomi. It's a her, so we call it as her. And so any commands that you issue or you humanly take today, conversationally using AI, conversation AI, you can talk to Nomi. Uh, you know, lower the uh, the temperature in the in the passenger cabin. Uh, Nomi enable the massage on the passenger seats. Nomi do this. Nomi do that. Nomi plays that video. Nomi call my friend. Call Santosh. Whoever conversationally you can do that. Uh, it's much much more than that. But you know, it, it's a physical. It's it knows your persona. Uh, you know, it can greet you. Uh, you know, on your birthdays and anniversaries and all that. So we are taking this to the next level in the next product we just launched uh, last week at the Neo Day. But you get the idea. So interior is more spacious and more digital and more AI driven. So again, the users, the insights that we took can be studied and learned is what it is drove us to this innovation in the future. But Tesla's thing is again, that the Tesla is more on performance. Uh, you know, can I get acceleration zero to 60 miles in 2.9 seconds or 1.9 seconds? So it's, you know, their angle has been more on the performance driven, not on the user experience driven. Now it is changing because the world needs more luxury, more space, not just performance. Because in India and China, for example, nobody can drive it that fast anyway. So performance is not the key attribute. It is mainly the, the, the immersive experience would be the new differentiator there. So um, just some survey, a quick survey, why uh, the the reason why the customers or the users are still hesitating or staying away from the new energy vehicles, mainly the electric vehicles? The research shows that you know the main impeding reason for the broader uh, you know broader adoption is the battery itself, because the battery is the most expensive component in an electric car, right? It's 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 about between fifteen thousand to twenty thousand U.S. dollars is the cost of a battery. Uh, and it's pretty expensive. You know, for that money, you can easily buy a Honda Accord, a luxury Honda Accord for a 20 to 25,000 US dollars uh, if you negotiate well, of course. But you get the point, that's fine. And also the battery re degradation, right? So every time you charge your car, of course, behind the scene, you know, there are individual lithium ion cells, right? You know, in, in a Tesla car, for example, there are about 7,000 individual lithium ion cells. They are put into modules and the modules are put into pack. And then pack is what it is into, it's like a bed that goes underneath your car. But the more you charge, the battery, the battery degrades faster. So there was a concern about battery degradation. That was the main reasons why the consumer adoption for EVs were still slow. It's changing now. Why? So Tesla tried to solve that charging anxiety uh, in three different ways. From the day one of the product launch, they said we need to remove that anxiety from the user uh, from owning this car. We're gonna invest and create our own supercharger network, which means just like we have uh, uh, gas stations or petrol stations as we call it in India, in almost every half kilometer, one kilometer, um, you know, here there are a lot of third party charging infrastructure in that, you know, every one mile, two miles there. But for the supercharging is mainly for long distance. Let's say, in the, you know, uh, Trichur to Palga, Trichur to Calicut, or from San Francisco to Los Angeles, it's a long distance and you know you want to have the worry free. So Tesla said, you know, we need to have supercharging, our own proprietary supercharging, fast charging. Still, it's not fast enough. It takes to fully charge a car, for example, a 70 kilowatt battery. It takes about, you know, for a normal charging, it takes about seven to eight hours. You can't afford to have eight to seven, eight to eight hours on a long distance and stay on the road for that long. So, but Excuse me. So the supercharging is now cut down, and it's it's about you know 30 to 45 minutes. You can easily get about 150 miles charged. That's good enough before you can get to the next station. So charging was the main um, innovation Tesla put in to remove that anxiety from adoption, broader adoption of electric vehicles. And then of course the home chargers. You know, uh, you know these are all AC chargers. 
and the supercharger is a DC charger. My company, we, we thought, you know, how can we even make that anxiety completely eliminate? So, um, in, you, know, you know, countries like the United States or Europe, where, you know, less populous, there is more infrastructure available. But then highly dense population countries such as India, China, Indonesia, et cetera, we, we don't have that much infrastructure to put in superchargers everywhere. So um, in China, because people don't, um, because it's, you know, this concept is from my company. So there, there, is, there is no, you know, independent homes or bungalows as we call it in India, mostly it's apartment systems because 1.34 billion people, a lot of people. So it's all apartment system. There is no charging infrastructure at home. They said, you know, we need to have a swappable technology. Swappable means when you are, uh, you know, driving your car, you don't have to worry about it. There are swapping stations on the way on the highway. Within two to three minutes, you should be able to swap out your battery and get a new battery put in automatically within three minutes. So that, that's how long it takes for you to fill a complete gas tank if it's an internal combustion engine. So we thought in that way and think that we need to have chargeable, certainly, because some people can afford it at, at home having a charger. Swappable is the right way to go. And sometimes we should be able to upgrade that battery. What I mean by that is, for example, you are taking your car from, you know, Trivandrum to Calicut or from Los Angeles to Denver, Colorado, or New York City, for that example. It's a long distance. So you want to have a much beefier uh, battery pack. You know, you bought a 70 kilowatt battery and you wanted to have a 150 kilowatt battery as an example. You should be able to pay with a small nominal upgradable fee and upgrade that battery to a much higher BP battery. You should be able to support that too. So our solution, our innovation we thought is it should be chargeable, it should be swappable, and most importantly, the upgradable of the battery uh, service system. That's exactly what we did from day one. Um, this is, we launched our innovation called Neo Power. On the left, you can see these are the various charging uh, infrastructure. This is the AC charging, which is seven kilowatt battery, which is your home charges and your home from the wall outlet, it's all AC current um, is what it is coming. You plug that into your car, it, the converter is in the car itself. So on the, on the charge pit, it converts the AC into DC and stores the DC charge onto the battery. So that's the, that. And then let me go to the next. <clears throat> So this is the power home. And now we said, you know, some people can afford, they want a faster charging even at home. So we came up with the DC charging, uh, which is uh, the converter is inside the charger itself, not inside the car. So it's much faster. It's a 20 kilowatt, which means it's three times as powerful as the power home charger. Of course, we have to answer Tesla's uh, supercharging infrastructure. There is a power charger also. But you get the point, slow, fast, and faster. That's on the charging side. This is the most interesting. This is a swappable. I have a quick video I want to show, demonstrate this. Uh, this is a live, uh, not live, actually it's a video, but it's on a live car that we did uh, to demonstrate this. I had this video shot for, for, uh, for our presentation today. Let me just uh, see if I can play it. Dark hook. So, so what you're seeing here is the car came in and then, you know, drove by itself. And this is just like a three car, um, you know, let me just go back. So this is, this space is, you know, it's a swappable station. It's only, you know, length of a three uh, parking spots. The car comes in, autonomously it can park inside. And then the robot comes in, takes the battery off from the old car, the car that you drove in and takes it out and puts a new battery. But in the background, what happens is every single car battery that's been removed from the car, carefully examined, uh, obviously for safety reasons, and we're proactively looking at the battery monitoring uh, systems also to see the, the health of the battery, the degradation of the battery, and so on and so forth. Because all the data is now available on the cloud, you can analyze and all that. Uh, but any, any fault has been found on this battery, it's been taken away from the rotation and then sent it, sent it for more thorough inspection. 
If initial inspection at the charging station is saying that this battery is good enough, and then we put back into the rotation, get fully charged and ready to be put in for the next car comes in for Sapopo. This has been pretty powerful. It's in less than three minutes or maximum four minutes, you can get a new car battery. So that's, that's an innovation that I don't think that even Tesla has it. So that's what it was needed to drive that adoption in countries like China, and then I'm sure in India in the future, because people don't have that much time, or they say, why don't we build a shopping station? This was one of the discussions that the Tamil Nadu chief minister uh, discussed when I met with him, saying that he's offering a lot of infrastructure in the state. You know, why don't we build this? I think we want to bring this technology to India as part of bringing more disruption in the EV space. And so that's, you get the point. So in summary, executive summary, that's, you know, there are four aspects. Um, my belief, I think autonomous vehicles are the future and EV is the future. Um, you know, the prediction is by 2025, um, I think that the level four cars will be on the road. And uh, you can see some industry prediction for what's going to be the global sales of self-driving cars. It's growing at an extremely fast, fast pace. You know, Tesla has delivered um, you know, over 1.2 million cars, um, you know, as of December 31st. They had, you know, less than two, you know, probably two, 300,000 cars until two years ago. So now the adoption is much faster because the charging solution is much, much more innovative. My company in the last uh, three years, I think uh, two and a half years to be uh, exact, we delivered over 80,000 cars. And because main thing is, this battery as a service business model, which is driven from the, the neo power, the swapping, uh, swapping technology I just demonstrated. So technology is there, but the level four technology, um, you know, the, especially the sensors like the LIDAR tech, uh, industry is still maturing. Um, so there are a lot of competition happening and yet to see who is going to win that battle and which will define the standard for LIDAR uh, for the usage of car. There are patents that are being filed almost every week from especially all the uh, fast advanced countries. You know, when I, mean, I checked the last, I think India still is slightly b behind these, uh, these countries. China is actually, you know, surprised to me, actually, they are filing more patents in level four than the rest of the other countries that we see it. The key challenges from my perspective, I see, as I mentioned, technology, I don't think it will be the challenge, but it's mainly the consumer acceptance because it's a safety, it's a comfort zone, and, uh, and, the, and the environment itself, right? It's a communication. Today, when you honk the car, we know that, hey, we are communicating to a pedestrian or the driver in front of you. Tomorrow, when you are not doing, what does that communication mean? It could be a different way of, you know, headlights flashing, who knows? So that, those standards need to be defined by the policymakers. So these are some of the challenges that I see it, but technology will be there by 2025, certainly before 2030 for sure for this. This is my last, <clears throat> last slide, uh, especially for, for the students um, who, are, who are listening and watching. Um, reflecting on my own uh, you know, professional journey from you know, graduating from Tuchur Engineering College in, in 88, all the way to where I am today, what I've seen is know yourself better. Okay? So the research shows that as humans, we don't know what we don't know about ourselves. So you take time to understand who you are as a person and what is the differentiating skill or attribute that you have as compared to your other friend or a colleague or your neighbor. So know yourself better. I think that is something that I will, uh, I will suggest to the aspiring engineers uh, who are going to be the technologists and the leaders and the business leaders of tomorrow. <clears throat> Follow your passion. You know, don't do just because your neighbor, your parents, or your professors, your mentors have asked you to do it. What is it that one thing or two things that is truly excites you as an engineer, uh, as a professional, follow that passion. Um, when I reflect on that, on the statement, you know, I always love computing, but my dad, who was my mentor back then, and he said, you know, um, I got admission to, uh, to Random Engineering College as well as to Chur. There was only five colleges back then uh, when we graduated or when we admitted in 84. So I got into three disciplines. Um, at both uh, to Andrew as well as Trichur, Trichur being closest to, and my dad used to work there in Trichur, so he knew that city pretty well. So um, he said, I think, you know, most mature disciplines at GECT back then was mechanical, electric, electrical, civil, and chemical. 
if you look back as of 84 the you know electronics was relatively and early and computer science was the first batch uh, that was offered in 84 so that's not the reason why i didn't go to computer science but my dad being my mentor and guide he said you know uh, you have to follow your passion i think all of my family members were in you know either in barc or in chemical factories in mumbai and others getting a job was the main thing he said oh as soon as you graduate i want you to get a job go to either mechanical civil or this that was, those were the prominent ones and that's the guidance my dad gave i took it but my passion was different i always loved computing and then playing with gadgets and stuff like that that's what i did right after college am i a chemical engineer yes i am am i truly a chemical engineer no i am not because right after college i lost a lot of this my i to, drove towards my passion so follow your passion that's that's what i'm trying to convey the message here you define your own success <clears throat> don't let others uh, define uh, what success means to you because it's up to the individuals for some individuals what i have seen is it's a money that is your definition of success for some individuals it could be uh, titles for some in, individuals it could be visibility you know i want to be known as i want to have public figures i need to be this i need to be that for some people they don't even know how to articulate uh, what definition of success means so take your time to talk to your heart and then figure out what do you think that success mean to each one of you you aspiring engineers of gct and right off the bat when you graduate uh, my call to action and suggestion for you is start building your professional network um again this is something that i learned over the years um you always be as a student i consider myself as a student even today as i mentioned um always i try want, i want to learn and meet with new people um so building your network is absolutely key um you know i tell my son i said you know jokingly um you know when he was in high school the older one i said you need to raise your hand you know raising the hand is you know especially in in you know children in india it's, it's like a shy everybody is shy I said you need to raise your hand so you want to be noticed and you want to create that a wanted magnet in you people want to notice you then only say even if it's a silly question you know oh yeah that you know that person that vivek who asked me that question on the other day you want to register in the other person's mind so start building that network i think that's the key seek mentorship you know don't don't think that you know i know everything trust me you know nothing the world is so vast and data is information is coming every single day adopt membership uh, mentorship Uh, to me there are two types of mentorship that i have seen uh, one is formal mentorship the other one is informal mentorship formal mentorship is mainly you know let's say you know you are aspiring to become like this person then you buddy up that person formally uh, let's say me and santosh or me and professor krishna kumar or me and sashi or me and for example we believe that we both have complementary skills and we mentor together so i teach them something and i learn from them something that is formal mentorship because in that you know you are seeking for critical feedback you know you don't want to hear from me that how great of a computer science engineer you are that you know you are but you want to adopt me as a mentor as an example that willing accept you know willing willingness to accept critical feedback i think you could do a better job in these 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 areas that's what i meant by that the informal mentorship is mainly you know how should i describe it it's tied to your passion let's say you are a you know you're a music lover a lover as an example as your passion or you are a sportsman or you are a, a movie uh, following person look at who are some of your aspiring musicians that that you always listen to let's say kj sudas for for us uh, you know all the keralites here right every concert from you know the moment he graduated from the music school has been a success for uh, das hetan follow him read about him watch his interviews how he prepares for his concert whether it's a classical music or a or a light music concert that is informal mentorship so you are modeling a, a a role model and you are learning something how he or she prepares for that concert same thing for movies right uh, say steven spielberg or 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 a, or a famous malayalam director every mo- movie he or she has made has been absolutely success it ran for one year two year in the theaters how he or she has has made that you know that movie why he has been successful 
that is informal mentorship but you get the point and everyone consider everyone is a leader don't think that you know my manager is a leader my you know my professor is a leader to me that doesn't make sense i don't think each one of us are our leader in our own world act and behave and own that right behave like that i am the leader i want to be the role model and be that self driven person as opposed to management driven person so don't wait for your for students you know don't ask your professor or a or a or a, or a you know head of the department to tell you to finish your assignments be driven you know do yourself and then say you know i i can have an additional assignment you know i didn't do this when i was uh, in college but now hindsight when i look back i think that's those are the characteristics that this world needs it now the self driven more and more people so the point is assume that everyone is a leader and as i mentioned be a student every single day and the last but not least in corporate world once you graduate always before hire the people who believe what you believe that's the success for a successful manager and the leader if you cannot articulate your own vision for your company for your project or your whatever it is that you are attracting for other people to join your movement are you able to successfully communicate communicate your belief to your other other people uh, who who you are trying to attract towards them so you hire those people who believe what you believe i think then you will have a great chemistry great team i think the success will be much faster than you think it is so with that i think i hope i was able to convey some thoughts and from my perspective and also for students some call to action to hopefully you will take it and then work on it and uh, you know we have exceptional fa faculty at gct uh, the uh, the alumni network is extremely strong people are there in around the world tap into it uh, to my point about build your network the day that you graduate out of your college don't be shy uh, you know speak yourself and define your own success i think you all will be uh i'm sure all of you will be the leaders of tomorrow from g city thank you thanks uh, so, ganesh great great presentation and uh great points that you you put out there for the for the students uh, just out of curiosity were you at the uh, alpha lodge yes i was at the alpha lodge um okay. so that's cool that's one so, thing you know i did not enjoy the hostel life actually um, i don't know how many of the participants were my alpha mates but oh um, there sajin is put in a comment so sajin oh, was at alpha lodge <laughs> so we used to play cricket yeah. together i don't i don't think you remember me santosh santosh yes i Sandy. do remember i do remember i do remember i, used to be I do a, remember yeah that yeah. was alpha was owned by uh, professor amaduti Yes, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. We used to play cricket. Is this and Santosh just... Raghavan? That's right. Who is this? Sandy. Yes, right. Sandy. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> oh my God! I think Shashi, thank you for the last name. I think no problem. You taught you you taught us how to play or uh, at least <laughs> attempt to make the break dance move at Alpha. Yes, that was me. So I was just asking Baiju, you know, hey, do you know this guy Ganesh? does he play did he play cricket with us those days and he said yes i think so but i wasn't sure you know but that's great you know fantastic <laughs> great to be wow. with ganesh <laughs> absolutely absolutely hey, ganesh uh, i think uh, stories like this would inspire the students more oh yeah yeah exactly yeah it's more about you know, the games and the stuff you did back then that really you know makes sense right Yeah so I yeah. uh, I have a burning question Ganesh do we yeah. all get a, a discount on this neo es8 everybody who attended today <laughs> why not uh, uh, once we are ready no, to especially so. in the us uh, no at least yeah I mean, i'll do something <laughs> just kidding don't worry for gct no i know i know a great presentation from uh, ganesh thank you sachin uh, hi ganesh uh, i have a question uh sure. regarding uh, tesla uh so uh, last year there are 80 million uh, cars sold in the world whereas uh, tesla sold only just short of 500000 uh, cars but uh, tesla's uh, market cap is 800 billion whereas uh, that uh, entire 
uh, all other cars uh, companies uh, total valuation is less than uh, 800 billion so mm-hmm. do you th- do you do you think that uh, this uh, tesla's 800 billion valuation is justifiable you know oh, that's a great question so let me answer that question by asking you a question and also give you a perspective on on apple you take an example of apple apple started i think it was in 1976 or 78 something around that and apple went ipo in 19 i believe in 1980 i think it was about 20 dollars or 20 25 dollars something like that ipo price and the apple's market cap- capitalization back then was about less than 2 billion us dollars it took 30 years for apple to get to 100 billion in 2007 when they launched this most disruptive iphone 1 the smartphone as a product right 100 billion it took 30 years for apple to achieve now in the last 13 years 2007 through 2020 if you look at Ap- apple's market cap grew from 100 billion to 2.1 trillion 21 times its growth putting that into perspective for tesla it's a great question you asked you know tesla has sold only 1.2 million cars as of december 31st 2020 because i track it very very closely um very closely but the rest of the world put together general motors toyota chrysler you name it much less than they have charged why it is is because i think they are the investors and they are all looking for the the future the driverless car smart connected premium electric are the four key ingredients of any automotive for tomorrow who is the pioneer who is the leader it's tesla today so investors and the everyone in my humble opinion they are all buying for the future because when this industry is fully disrupted by 2030 we can we can look at even india numbers the transportation minister has uh, boldly put a put a stake in the ground by 2030 india will stop selling internal combustion engine car 2030 is only 9 years from now it's going to happen just like that right so you have to transform and disrupt and replace and displace all of these internal combustion engine cars onto the electric cars who as the um, you know recipe for success it is tesla right now they are the leaders now there are other 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 companies like neo for example we are coming so that is in, investors are always looking for tomorrow what innovation are you going to bring in for me to the mainstream tomorrow they don't care about what you did yesterday that's the reason why the legacy automakers like including toyota they are struggling because they got 20 30 or 50 product portfolios in their r&d it's so difficult for them to transform and all of that into the onto the onto the right side tesla didn't have any any legacy clean sheet of paper neo we don't have anything we didn't have anything we started from drawing whiteboard drawing how should architect this cars that's the reason why in my opinion why these companies valuations are going is it justifiable being a tesla shareholder i think i love it that explosion but it's sometimes i feel i think it is over a bubble because you know it's for the vision it's for elon i think he's to me he is arguably the the smartest engineer product architect and the innovator this world has ever seen so that's why tesla is going at that but it's a great question and perspective okay thank ganesh, you uh, oh, narayan so, i have a question sorry, one, on, one more question uh, uh, ganesh so uh, tesla uh, uh, market cap is 800 billion whereas uh, neo uh, has only 87 billion if i am not wrong uh, so do you do you think that the move from tesla to neo is uh, uh, successful or uh, do you regret there's no regrets at all there's no regrets, no regrets. right it's okay yeah there are similarities and there are differences i think nelson asked me when i was talking to him a couple of days ago uh, professor nelson um what are the similarities and differences between these two disruptive companies tesla and neo i said there are similarities and differences the similarities are both are making smart connected electric premium cars the difference is i think i touched on it briefly tesla's core innovation is about the performance you know can i drive this car from 0 to 100 miles it it was at 5.9 seconds then reduced to 4.5 seconds 3.9 seconds now elon is saying 1.2 or 1.9 seconds performance was the core the vision for neo is completely different it is 
this company was built, our vision is to create something called user enterprise. We start with the user. We are building a user social network and the car is just a fabric or a product to connect and build that community of users. There's a big difference between the two. The reason I quit is because of this, you know, the Neo CEO's vision when he uh, interviewed me or recruit, tried to recruit me. Um, that I thought, you know, pretty, very unique. And he also mentioned about this, you know, battery slapping his vision that he has. He didn't use the term battery as a service back then. He said he's going to detach the car and the battery as two separate sales transactions. I said, wow, that's an interesting thought because the most expensive component is a battery. And wouldn't it be nice if you can actually, you know, have you buy the shell of the car and then do battery as a service, a monthly and annual subscription fee. Beauty is you don't have to worry about the battery degradation. You don't have to worry about the, the faster innovation that is taking place in the battery industry because Neo will do all the innovation and you get always the latest and greatest battery put in your car. You pay a monthly as a service subscription fee. I thought that business model is something unique, which Elon never thought about it before, because his focus was mainly performance. So uh, they are two different like uh, outsource outsource service for the batteries. A battery is not; uh, it's a separate company we established. So you buy the car uh, from Neo, and you lease or subscribe to the uh, the battery from this company X, which Neo is. Uh, you know, uh, investor, and then some of the battery te uh, technology companies are also part of it. So you as a user, you pay, you know, $150 per month as a subscription fee for the battery, just like you but pay for your Netflix. Does, yeah, but does Neo provide any sort of guarantees on that or they stay Absolutely. completely out of it? So no, 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 it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, every battery is given minimum eight years full warranty. So no, it's Tesla, okay, Tesla cool. do it. Yeah, because right. otherwise, you know, yeah, that's going to be even more headache, right? More yeah, production. exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah there is okay. full warranty on this, uh, this car. But now, by the way, the, you know, this technology is changing into solid state, uh, which will be much more safe, uh, safer, high energy density, um, and lesser cost. Um, so that's where the innovation is going now. It is, you know, this car that you see the picture here, we announced a 150 kilowatt battery using solid state technology. It's not a liquid electrolytes anymore, it's solid state. So to produce it, it takes some time, but you know, but we believe by, by the time that we are ready to launch uh, you know, that car, I think the industry will be there. But I just thought India announced something a couple of days back, I think. Uh electric battery driven car for thousand kilometers or something. I'm not sure, but that's what I thought I saw. It must be from Tata, but they said they could drive or, you know, put a car on the road for thousand KM on electric battery. You know, okay. Yeah, that's no, no, that, that's us. We, we just said this 150 kilo uh, battery pack, you can go up to hundred oh, kilometers. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Ganesh, I have a question. Um, so, when you are thinking about like the last form of automation, where the car will drive itself using AI, um, how long do you think the security? How much more do you think our security oh, right now needs no, to be no, advanced? Um, for it to become an, a reality. This advancement Great in question. security, how many years do you think? Like, you know, hackers and stuff, they move in, with the time, right? That's yeah. Right. You know, Safety hackers, is job is, hackers job is to write more sophisticated uh, malware code, right? They are also engineers. They are also programmers. They are also learning AI. Um, you know, now bots are actually injecting malware when you sleep. So, uh, you know, there is nothing called 100% security in the world, right? Whether it's any product you take, the security engineer's main job is how high can you make the wall, security wall, so that you make it difficult for the hacker to climb across the wall. So you can make as high as possible, meaning you can put adequate controls and innovation into your security framework. 
I doubt there is 100% security. So, yeah, there is a risk. Uh, when the car is not being driven, uh, you know, some analysts, they, they say this can be used as a weapon, potentially. Think about that, right? Because it's, a, it's an autonomous car, you know, which means uh, these are the problems that the security engineers and security architects uh, are, are thinking through day in and day out. But absolutely, security has to be even higher. If I, you know, if I go back and, uh, you know, on my, the, this slide that I shared, security is a foundation when you are architecting this supercomputer inside the car from day one. You can't just keep this as an optional element. It's, it's, it's part of your, um, you know, from the day one of the design. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, yes, I understood that, but like uh, how many years do you think it will take uh, for them to reach a point where they start creating walls that are higher, that, that keep growing uh, according to the hackers? Like as the hackers keep making bigger ladders, they keep raising it's, the wall. It's, like, uh, it's always gonna be a catch me if you can game. Yeah, so, okay, so okay. It's, it's gonna, there's not it's gonna, gonna be a definitive way. It's going to take I was going to ask point, there any security guys here on this call. Maybe they can answer better yeah. than I can. It's going to take 5.637 years. <laughs> that is no so idea. precise, as always. <laughs> no, like you said, yeah. like you said, Ganesh, I mean, security is a comfort factor, right? I mean, it's like gold plating. You can have 5 mm, 10 mm, but you know, you can never have that perfect security. Yeah. The best thing you yep. can do is to make it very difficult for the intruders to get in and to by in. fencing yeah. your. And, and, and obviously, then the, you, there will also be subsequent steps that you can take up once they do um, uh, illegal right. and, and come, you know, regulatory, et cetera. Uh, but 100% security is a fantasy. It's a fantasy. Yeah, it's, I 100% agree. That's why these companies are now partnering with some top-notch universities and have tapped into their researchers because researchers always look for what's happening around the world, right? And, you know, what are these intruders doing? You know, what are they writing? So using right. they are studying what my yeah. neighbor is writing on, right? So yes. we are recruiting uh, at my company for sure, you know, partnering with yeah. some top university researchers because we don't have a bandwidth and the researchers right. do research work. Right, that's why you pay right. their expertise. Yes, big dollar. And, and and every innovation um, makes a lot of people happy, and at the same time, uh, leave a lot of people unhappy in the wake. Uh, to the point, you know, that Santosh was raising about his, you know, um, uh, his pleasure of uh, being able to drive at sixty miles an hour on a fast track uh, will be taken away by some of these innovations. But that, those types of things have been happening around the world. Uh, since time immemorial. For example, uh, when calculators came around, those who were using you know, um, uh, uh, logarithm tables or slide rule, they were unhappy. They said, oh, this is taking the pleasure away. I mean, why calculator? I mean, I can do the same thing with the, my logarithm table, but you know, that's, it's an uphill battle. Nobody will win, right? Because th this kind of changes will happen whether we like it or not. And, and there will be more such disruptive um, changes in the world in the next 10 years. In the last 25 years, there, were, there have been more changes than probably the previous 100 years or 200 years. So the rate that, at which things are changing is exponential. And, and by, who knows, by the time some of these uh, listeners, in, I mean, some of the um, youngsters in our um, company today, by the time they retire, they might be able to download hardware. I, I kid you not. I mean, it, 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 right now it might be fantasy. I mean, just to, you know, small thing like you know i i downloaded my masal dosha this morning i mean things like that it can happen 20 years later or 30 years later i mean you may have a gadget with the cartridges in it that will you know the ingredients will be uh, sent to you via um, some service online and masal dosha, it will spit out masal dosha i mean maybe things like that will happen i mean th this may sound crazy but um, it's gonna it's happen. pretty possible we have 3d printers that is a possibility yes. It is. But I think so from a for security the point of view, I don't think there's, there's a 100% there's a guarantee that, you know, within a certain point of time, you can achieve 100% security. I don't think that's going to happen, right? It's an ongoing thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, in terms uh, of, right. you know, battling, uh, you know, people who try to 
penetrate your security system and and those who are trying to protect that, right? So that's going to be an ongoing thing. There's never going to be a guarantee to say within the next two years we can make sure that your system is not going to be penetrated. I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, yeah. it can be guaranteed that it won't be secure. Nothing yeah. will be 100% exactly. secure. Exactly. Yeah, the... I mean, things things keep happening. Yeah. And yeah. It, like I said, it's going to be a catch-me-if-you-can game, right? Yeah. Yeah, but the students listening, if you want to pursue a career in security, you will never lose a job. It's a good well point because right. I well think said. that's a great, great kind of uh, opportunity you can pursue. It's going to be in that, that area. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, as she said, you know, there's nothing called perfect. I think good enough is the new perfect. Right? It's, if you wait for 100% perfection, you will never ship your product on time. So we have to define the 80-20 rule, right? It's, yeah. You innovate on that last 20% always, day in and day out. So uh, I, I see that there are some questions in the chat window, and I don't know if they want, if they can't ask the question or if somebody I mean, yeah. who is moderating, if they can you know, pick up these questions and ask Ganesh, this would be a good, good opportunity. Please. Yeah, students, don't be shy. Please ask questions. You know, this call to actions. That's one slide yeah. that I would like you to it, take it. It. It, it, may, it may be shyness. It may be something else. It may be technology, uh, for example. Um, you know, so um, whatever the reason, um, if somebody can try to. Malayalam you know. film, Malayalam film, yeah. there's no issues. Okay, don't be shy. <laughs> so we all been the, there. Yeah. We all been there, done that. Uh, I see I answer, yeah. Okay, let me ask one more question, uh, Ganesh. Uh, so, uh, do you think uh, this uh, uh, Chinese companies like Neo, Xpeng, uh, Li, uh, they can compete with uh, Tesla? Anyone can compete with anyone, right? Just look at, you know, between Apple. When Apple came in, they thought everybody's going to get into the Apple smartphone. Guess what? The data shows now Google has more apps download than Apple. Look at even luxury cars, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Audi, Volkswagen. The world needs all different sort of innovative, innovative products, right? I don't think there is, you know, you know winner takes all uh, proposition here. There's always market. This market is so big, right? Market size is so, so big. There's almost what, you know, out of this seven plus five billion people around the world, there's about close to 3 billion automo automobile vehicles. So there is market for everyone. So it's, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not anyone's game. Look at, you know, Tesla is only 1.2 million cars shipped. In two and a half years, we shipped 80,000. That's because we don't have a mass market product, cheaper product. The moment that comes in, game on, right? So competition is always a, you know, it's, it's a, you know, like our, my, uh, a new president, Joe Biden, he said, you know, Russians are enemies. Chinese are competitors. Right? That's because Indians are competitors. Because it's, uh, I think the, the greatest minds are in, in India as in China to the next two greatest economies. I think India, I would love to see India doing more deception in this automotive world, smart connected world, and then come up with a product that we all should be, as Indians, should be proud of. It takes time. But there is market for every every player, trust me. Otherwise, we wouldn't be, nobody will be buying Kia cars, for example, or Hyundai car. They are great cars. There is market for every product that we live in. Okay, thank you. You're so, uh, there's two questions I would like to ask. One is from a student, actually. And second one is my own. Okay. I'm Gopi. Okay, first one is like uh, from Ashwin Rajesh. Is that like, I feel Indian roads would be one of the most challenging environments for self-driving. From potholes to non-existent lane boundaries in places to chaotic driving. It would be a really difficult, different situation from roads in other developed countries. So do you think it will be possible for self-driving in India with the current infrastructure? How much time do you estimate it will take for self-driving to reach the mainstream in India? That is a question raised by Ashwin Rajesh, a student. Okay. Hey, Ashwin, and, great question. Yeah. I'm happy that you asked the question. You know, 
I think the main, main uh, it's not about you know, electric cars per se, uh, personally, my viewpoint, I think the main issue that I see with India is the infrastructure. Um, for example, I don't know, Shashi, you were there or not, when uh, the greatest economist India has ever produced, Dr. Subramanian Swami, when he visited yeah. Bay Area, there was, a, there was a, a dinner event with him. So I was, I was invited, I was there. So the call to action uh, Dr. Swami had was, you know, today, United States is number one economy, followed by China, followed by India. So India is number three in the economy, in the world economy. There's no reason why India cannot be definitely number two and eventually number one in five to 10 years from now. Why we are not able to do that part as Indians? He said, the call to action for Swami was that I want and India wants all of you back in India. Why you are not coming to India? Because he said infrastructure. The example he gave was exactly this question Ashwin asked. You know, it's, it, it's fact. At the same time, I felt very ashamed uh, when he made this comment, which was, Indians don't know how to build roads between Chennai to Mumbai, but Indians know how to build and have built roads in Singapore, Malaysia, or even Iraq after the war, World War. Oh, after the Iraq, Iraq War. Why is that? It's not like we don't have the know-how and we don't have the technology and the architects to build top-notch roads infrastructure. That is the main issue that I see that I think once we solve that infrastructure issue, it's changing, by the way. We have made quantum, quantum leap and progress in that area, but still it's not up to the point where some of the other developed countries are. Once we fix that issue, I think all of these, you know, these autonomous cars, electric cars, I think it will be the mainstream in India. That's, that's my belief. When will it happen? I think it all depends on how fast we can solve this infrastructure issue that India has. You know, putting this gas station is relatively easy, right? You can, you know, there is a franchise is there for it. But someone has to invest and then put a stake in the ground, right? You know, maybe, uh, you know, Reliance Industries, they own a lot of the gas stations. Why can't we put a charging pole, electric charging pole in each of the gas stations? to drive that adoption and take that anxiety away from charging. So there are various things the policymakers and the politicians have to make. But to me, I think the main infrastructure issue is the one that I see that is, um, that is the, the hesitation for getting those electric cars in the mainstream in India. Ashwin, that's my viewpoint. Okay, thank you. Shashi, uh, you, know, next, you, might, you might have, uh, you know, Shashi always, uh, it, it's good to, good to debate with. Actually, uh, feel free to share your, your thoughts. I think it's, it's alumni meet. It's not my meet. Thank you, Ganesh. Thank you, but uh, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Stuff beyond sure. that. Thank you. Okay, yes. so one, I think one more question. I, I just wanted to put yeah. the next question. So you, you've been a chemical engineer. I just want to know the impact on environment on this battery technology. I mean, after some time, we are going to end up with a lot of unusable batteries. And yeah. how are we, I mean, uh, the disposing of these batteries, will the, won't they create another environmental issue? That's a great, great, great question. You know, for a you know, chemical engineer to think in that way, you know, that's start doing some innovation in that area. Uh, whoever asked the question, that question, right? So the number one problem with the electric car they're trying to solve is the pollution, uh, the, the CO2 emission issues, right? So now governments are giving subsidies. The more you drive electric cars, the, the number of miles that you drive, um, the manufacturer of that company, let's say Tesla or Neo in this example, at the end of the, each year, the government gives you the carbon credit in terms of dollars or whatever currency you are in. So that you promote that. So it's an incentive, it's an additional revenue stream these companies get at. So, but you know, the other problem you brought up is about yeah, after n number of years, there will be a, this battery becomes completely useless and it is hazardous material, etc. So today in the United States, at least there are two or three uh, battery recycling facilities. But now there are, in fact, the CTO and the co-founder of Tesla, he quit Tesla to start a battery recycling innovation center called uh, Redwood Materials, because there are leaders who started thinking about once electric cars goes into mainstream there's going to be a lot of these lithium ion cells, which are hazardous, more potentially more hazardous than just the internal combustion engine, CO2 and other emissions. So innovation is happening. I think uh, there are a few companies in uh, Scandinavia, specifically Sweden, 
which I know personally, um, one gentleman who is the CEO there. So they are ready to solve this problem, um, not scaling, but at least they are prototyping it to uh, somehow recycle safely these lithium ion battery cells. But absolutely that's a valid concern, but people are started thinking about it, how to solve it. So we don't create one problem after another problem. I think that's, that's the main thing. Yeah, thank you. And, and and one of the things I would really like to bring up is when you when you find such a problem, I I think you should also be thinking about what the solution could be, right? Instead yeah. of trying to figure out where are these companies heading towards, you yourself should be trying to figure out, okay, if you've got so many batteries out there, what is the solution for us to ensure that we have a program? to be able to recycle this or to reuse this or dispose this off, right? And that's something yeah. that, you know, you really need to take in and think about. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, since our principal and, and uh, head of the department are here, I think that's something that I would like to see, you know, GECT taking a, a research project, you know, study this. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. Electric battery, I think this is, the, yeah. Who knows? You know this. You know the companies will partner with if you have a sponsored program like this innovation and that around. We have enough chemical engineers. We have enough innovators. We have supporters. We all can collaborate together. And then I think that I would like to see a a program sponsored by GECT as a research project. Yeah. On this Take issue. that up as a project and figure out what the different proposals could be, right, to address this exactly. issue. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, this uh, is coming to India this year, and uh, the uh, export duty, the import duties are like really crazy, around hundred percentage of the price of the car. So, how long do you think that this price would get stabilized so that uh, electric cars would be in like uh, one of four households in India? Uh, I think that Tesla, uh, when a big competitor like Tesla comes to India, then only would other companies would be like. Uh, really feel the competition and the prices would get low. So how long do you think that this, uh, how, long, how, how many years would, do you think that this would happen? Yeah, <clears throat> a good question again. All these are great questions. So the main reason why it is, you know, between countries and between governments, there is always this trade policies and all that, right? That's tariff uh, duties, et cetera, et cetera. You are correct. You know, the higher the value product, the higher the taxation for the tariffs are. For, uh, for you take Tesla as an example, right? Before Tesla entered China, so it was the California-made Teslas were imported to China. The same car that I drive here, which was 40% more to buy in Shanghai or in Beijing or any part in China, because that is how much the tariff was. It was not affordable. So Elon was not able to, Tesla was not able to sell as many cars. The way that he solved the problem is putting a local factory. You partner with the local government policymakers, and it, it's a win-win, right? The government, it's for the local state or the city, it is an economic development. So it's a give and take, right? So you negotiate, they give you know, free infrastructure like water, electricity, or, or anything else like that. Hello? Ganesh, we can hear you. No problem. Okay, I, I think I just- I, I, I think I just, Zoom says you just left. You're, you're, no, you're no, 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 I'm uh, okay. My phone is, I don't know why, but I'm, I'm glad I used my telephony. So yeah, you can hear me. So that's, that's good. So um, I'll, I'm joining back again. Um, yeah, we can still hear you. That's on the show. Yeah, it's just a video that's lost, Ganesh. Okay, okay. Okay, so I'm... Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. we, we can hear you. Yes. I think there is a little bit yeah, of a we can hear you. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm taking, I'm using my computer audio. I don't know what happened. Yeah, I lost my thought. Um, so it's mainly the local factory that's that's what it is needed to make uh, the price go lower. I think it will be no different in India. I think Tesla is still looking, in my opinion, I think they were either looking at shipping the car from California or from Shanghai factory. Import duty will be there. That's why Mr. Modi, when he visited to have the discussion, and then I had the discussion with the Tamil Nadu CM for, uh, for potentially looking at new facility there, they are willing to give infrastructure. 
you know, uh, free electricity, free water, building the roads leading up to the factory, even to the point they said, being a new brand, we can use all the government fleet on your product to show that initial adoption, right? So the policymakers also have to step in, but uh, short answer is I think until we put a local factory there in India, I think it's it's gonna be expensive for, for such luxury products. Is, isn't this really a question about protectionism versus what we can do from an economic perspective? That's what it is, right? I mean, we've been doing that in India for years, protecting certain segments and yeah. then ensuring that, you know, there's no intervention from, you know, uh, outside of the country. And this is exactly the same thing, isn't it? As far as, you know, we don't have the capabilities within the country, we will protect the nation. And the moment we build that capability, then we say, okay, here we are. And then now if you want to compete, you come and compete. Is that what it is? Yeah. You know, otherwise, you know, the local governments have to do what Chinese are done or doing. They won't let a foreigner to go set up a factory there. They demand you do a joint venture. Yeah, exactly. You do a joint venture. So yeah. Yeah, you I mean, do a GV. Exactly <laughs> like what Maruti did, right, years ago yeah. with the Japanese companies. And that's what they need to do. Yeah. Build a JV and start it off. Yeah. Sorry. I think that's what uh, Tesla is going to do uh, JV with the Tata Motors, right? That's what I heard. Yeah. The, the rumor is, you know, they are looking at potentially uh, yeah. using the unused capacity of Tata Motors, but who knows? But the, these are all speculations. So I mean, not yet to depend on the other. But yeah. the point that's is, for. Uh, wait for their uh, 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 January and uh, uh, quarterly re result. They expect to publish that in the quarter yeah. result year. Yeah. Any other questions? Because um, I'm not looking at the chat. Nowadays, okay, I mean, let's not get into any geopolitical tension type questions like the border issues and all that that's that's outside of the scope of this forum so please don't post any sensitive questions around politics so this is not for that so not all right on. okay ganesha i gotta get off get off okay time to sleep all right great great uh, session ganesha fantastic okay thank you very much ganesh thank you okay, i think yes. back to you uh, either Nelson or Naushika, I think. I guess there are no, no more questions. Over to Jayan, sir, for the vote of thanks. OK. Uh, I am Jayan. I, am actually, I, I belong to 8892 batch of GEC Trishur. I am personally a professor in electronics and communication department. And uh, I, on behalf of GEC, Government Engineering College Trishur and GECT alumni, I express sincere thanks to Ganesh V. Iyer for an inspiring uh, lecture, I would say. It was very inspiring and it was rich in technical contents and more importantly, rich in technical concepts. And he has actually taken us very smoothly and successfully from point A, the present day vehicle technology to point B, which, I, uh, which is actually the future of uh, vehicle technology. And the trip was very smooth and he has shared a lot of his experiences, very good. And he has motivated the students to take up challenging opportunities in the uh, field that they are going to face uh, tomorrow. I sincerely thank you, sir, for a very good lecture, very inspiring lecture. And I also take this opportunity to thank all the batchmates and friends and all the family members of Gloria uh, for uh, taking initiatives to arrange such a very good lecture series in her memory. And I also thank uh, our principal, uh, Dr. Shiba Vyas and Krishnu Marsar and all other alumni participants, all student participants and all fa uh, faculty participants uh, who were present and who made this program a very, very grand success. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night to everyone. And then Shashi, I think we can see you. Sure, sure.